We've talked about trauma and what it is, and now I want to give you some context for what's happening in the brain as trauma occurs. So we'll start by introducing you to interpersonal neurobiology. And this is a conglomeration of about 12 different sciences. Daniel Siegel, who is a doctor of psychiatry, coined this term. And what we're looking at is using all these sciences to see how the brain functions in relationship to other people, our interpersonal relationships. How do we apply trauma-informed care in the perinatal period? And this workshop emphasizes perinatal care, although this information applies to any healthcare provider. So the first thing I'm going to refer you to is the handout on biodynamic care. So when we talk about biodynamic care, we're talking about care based in physiology and specifically in the perinatal period, an awareness of how stress hormones, catecholamines like adrenaline and epinephrine and norepinephrine and cortisol and other cortical hormones impact and interact with other hormones, especially oxytocin. So what are the ways that we can help to keep oxytocin high and stress hormones low? These ways also can help keep the brain calm. So there are, there's a relationship and a cross-fertilization that happens here. Transfers from planned home births and planned birth center births which we will call community births, to hospitals happen regularly all across the United States. These transfers happen when pain medication or labor augmentation is needed or when complications arise. We know that about 11% of all planned community births transfer to the hospital. Transfer to the hospital is not a failed home birth or a failed birth center birth. It's safe and appropriate care for those births that need a higher level of care. When transfer is needed, midwives, emergency medical services, or EMS, and receiving hospital providers like obstetricians and nurse midwives function as a care team whether we recognize it or not. The birthing person and or the baby are cared for by midwives, EMS, and receiving providers, the physicians, nurse midwives, and nurses in the hospital in turn. When we work together smoothly, we can improve outcomes and the experience of care for mothers and babies. So I think about like the hypothalamus as being kind of like the foreman in a warehouse, the one who's kind of shouting like, hey, we need this job done. And the pituitary is going to receive that message and it's going to then signal to the organ to do its job. And once that job is done, the customer who receives the product is going to give feedback and say, everything is great, we got what we needed. When people are depleted and they are overwhelmed, they're afraid of feeling energy again. It's like different, you know, they're used to feeling a little tired, a little fatigued, and sure they want help, but, but when they begin to feel this energy that's coming back into their body, there's, there's a little bit of um, just a, an anxiety about moving forward with that. So I wanted to point out the difference between adaptogens and stimulants. Um, they are not stimulants, and, and here's why. So when we have adaptogens, we see that the recovery process after that exhaustion, we see that it's high. With stimulants, low. Stimulants deplete energy, adaptogens don't. Um, stimulants are, have a p addiction potential, whereas adaptogens don't. Um, stimulants have side effects, you guys know that. Adaptogens, it's, only, it's very rare, and usually in cases where people didn't use them appropriately. And this last one, this is really what we're gonna be um, exploring today. The adaptogens work in part by protein synthesis. They help our cells have gene expression of whatever it is that cell's supposed to do. Stimulants decrease that. So you get this energy, but it's, it's about a cellular intelligence energy and efficiency within the cell, whereas with stimulants, it's superficial and it's very exhausting.